dear academicians and researchers, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, I am Artrim Chamili from the Faculty of Engineering uh, at Istanbul Commerce University in Istanbul, Turkey. And it's my pleasure to be part of the IEEE International Conference on Smart Mobility, where I'm going to present my paper entitled A Constant Time, Secure and Private Evaluation of Decision Trees in smart cities enabled by mobile IoT. Uh, the scope of the problem, namely, uh, we have a lot of machine learning classification algorithms, including decision trees, which are used on a variety of scenarios, uh, such as disease diagnosis in clinics, ransomware detection in cybersecurity companies, credit card fraud detection in banks, and so on. However, uh, security and privacy concerns regulated by laws and other regulations uh, are a main obstacle for the widespread for the widespread usage of such machine learning algorithms basically we're dealing with a scenario where a server has an already trained machine learning algorithms concretely in our case a decision trees and we have one or more clients which have unclassified query that they wish to classify using the service um, trained model, decision model, but they want to do it in private uh, and secure fashion. Namely, from the server's perspective, the server, the owner of the trained decision trained model wants to keep it private because it's the revenue model from them. And furthermore, disclosing, making it public might reveal some data related to the data set that uh, on top of which the decision tree model was trained. As for the client, the client query might, cons might contain some private and sensitive data such as uh, credit card numbers or uh, private uh, patient records, health records, and so on. So they want to keep it uh, secret on both sides. Uh, to this end, uh, there are several of um, privacy preserving or secure private decision tree evaluations, with, uh, schemes that are proposed in the literature. However, most of the state of the art one partially fulfill the strict security and privacy requirements in smart cities, uh, which is going to be elaborated in a while. To this end, the paper's contributions are the following. Initially, a set of already existing secure building, building blocks are used, improved, extended, and adjust to fit the needs of the address scenario and architecture. On top of the proposed secure building blocks, a couple of novel secure decision tree classification or inference algorithms are proposed, which are done uh, having in mind strict security, privacy, and efficiency constraints. Uh, theoretical analysis and extensive experimental evaluations show that the proposed secure decision tree classification algorithms outperform the state-of-the-art ones in terms of computation and communication costs, as well as on security and privacy characteristics. So, related research uh, is basically elaborated in this uh, table, where we compare the proposed schemes of this paper with other related state-of-the-art schemes in the literature among different uh, security and privacy characteristics. And I just want to emphasize a few of them, namely our schemes, our proposed schemes uh, are the only one in literature where the computation and communication costs don't rise with the depth of the tree in most of the cases. We also have a constant time evaluation of decision trees. Uh, our schemes don't reveal the depth of the tree and they deal with multiple queries simultaneously. By the way, by state of the art, we mean only schemes that explicitly deal with decision tree evaluation, secure private decision tree evaluations. So the system architecture and the participants are the following. We have one or more clients, and the clients have the decryption key. And the server has a trained model. Um, they are both in the semi-honest model, both the server and the client or the clients, which means that they follow the protocol, but on the background, they try to infer some data which they're not supposed to. 
the server owns, of course, a private decision tree, while the client has a pair of somewhat homomorphic encryption public crypto key systems. And we are going to see in a while what is that. So they have a public crypto system, a pair of keys. And all of the encryptions are done using the client's public key. That means that only the client can decrypt the ciphertexts. Also, communication channels are not assumed to be safe. Okay, so let's go with the preliminaries. Uh, the first crypto scheme that I'm throwing to you is, and it's the only one because it's enough, is somewhat homomorphic encryption public key crypto systems which are based on the hardness of ring LWE, ring learning with errors. And basically they allow two homomorphic operations. And what are homomorphic operations? Basically homomorphic operations allow us to do some operations on the ciphertext without decrypting them. What kind of operations? Additions and multiplications. The number of such homomorphic operations is, is limited and especially the number of multiplications and the number of consecutive homomorphic multiplications that we can perform on the ciphertext without decrypting it, it's called the depth of the circuit. The plain text and the ciphertext are polynomial rings. Basically they are polynomials, coefficients of the polynomials of degree n, and uh, they are all integer. So basically, uh, plain text and ciphertext are encoded in polynomials of degree n in the coefficients of those polynomials, such as the plain text. All of the coefficients of the plain text of the polynomial have our integers modulo t, and the coefficients of the ciphertext polynomials are coefficients modulo q, such that q is much greater than t. If the degree polynomial n and the corresponding plain text and ciphertext uh, coefficient moduluses t and q are chosen properly, then we can apply the Chinese remainder theorem, which basically enables us a component or index slot-wise homomorphic SIMD operations over the polynomial coefficients. Now, main operations are basically illustrated in this figure. Main operations of a certain somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme are the following. Led by M underline V. So always when we have underline V, we denote a vector of integers and we are dealing and encrypting only integers, vectors of integers. So MV is an integer vector. Encrypting and encoding MV with a public key is done with this function. And this, the result is a ciphertext denoted as M underline C. So it's a ciphertext. So all the ciphertexts, their name has, in the end, have underlined C. Only encoding a vector, MV, this vector, into a plain text is denoted as, as M underlined P. So all of the plain texts have underlined P in their name. Furthermore, we saw that some automorphic encryption schemes allow for additions and multiplications to be done in uh, SIMD fashion. Basically, if I have one ciphertext AC and BC, if I add them, I'll have another ciphertext CC, or instead of BC, I can have a plain text. So basically I can add, I can add a ciphertext AC and a plain text BP. The result will be a ciphertext. And it's illustrated basically in this figure over here. So if I add two ciphertexts, it's basically one operation. However, one addition on the background, what happens is SIMD, single instruction multiple data additions of component wise or index wise slots of AC and BC, namely five and two is seven. So this uh, this is the first coefficients. Those are the first coefficients of uh, the corresponding uh, uh, ciphertexts that are being added or eight plus one is nine, three plus four is seven and so on. Although we do one operation addition, all in the background, basically, we have n such additions in uh, in SIMD fashion. Similarly, we can add, we can multiply two ciphertexts or a ciphertext and a plain text, and the result will be another ciphertext, such that when we multiply those a cipher, two ciphertexts or ciphertext and plain text, basically, in the background, what happens is SIMD multiplication of index-wise or component-wise uh, coefficients such as let's say five multiplied by two is 10, eight multiplied by one is eight and so on. Furthermore, what we can do is to rotate uh, 
the coefficients of the plane text. Basically, if this is if this is my AC, and if I rotate it by two to the right, then all of the coefficients will be rotated by two places. So one was in the first spot. Now, after rotating by two, it's going to be in the third spot. Eight was second. Now it's going to be fourth. Three was in the third spot. Now it's going to be in the fifth. Whereas the last two are going to kind of circle around and go in the beginning. Of course, by decode means decoding a certain plain text into an integer vector. And decrypt and decode function takes as a ciphertext as an input and returns the corresponding integer vector that uh, uh, encrypts, that the ciphertext encrypts. Now, let's see binary decision trees. And when we talk about decision trees, basically we talk about complete trees. And if they're not complete, we can just add some dummy nodes to make them complete. So we have F sets of features denoted from F1 to FF. And we have a set of C classes, which form the set of classes we go from C1 to CC. And we have L plus one levels enumerated from zero through L. Such that, such that each level has two to the power of lowercase l nodes, since we're dealing with complete trees, where, of course, lowercase al goes from zero to l plus one inclusive. Now, let's use some notation. The first superscript gives the level of, a subscript actually should be here, gives the level of the node and the second subscript gives the order inside of the level. So basically, if we have this tree, the root, the first node over here, uh, is going to belong to feature zero, zero. Zero, the first zero means it's level zero. And inside of the, that level, it's basically the first feature. Now, if you go in the second level, or a basic level one, the, this one, uh, its feature is going to be F10. So basically, it's first level, node zero. The second one is going to be first lever, note one, and so on till the end. Similarly, inside of each note, we have their corresponding thresholds. So in the root, we have threshold zero, zero. And by the way, those features form the feature order, starting from the root and in order till the end. So this is my feature order. Then we have uh, the threshold values which are inside of the nodes. So this is threshold zero, zero corresponding to feature zero, zero, threshold one, zero corresponding to feature one, zero, and so on till the end. Um, they are going to form the threshold um, model, basically, which is a decision tree model DTMV vector. So the corresponding, the threshold corresponding to the feature order are going to, follow, to, to form the decision tree model vector DTMV. And now, if we have a query x underline v of integers such as x00 belongs to the feature set f00, x10 belongs to the feature f10, what we're going to do, we're going to kind of compare all of the entries in order of the, of the query with the thresholds in order. And based on the, that, if the corresponding comparison is small or equal then we're going to the left side. Uh, otherwise, we are going to the right side. If it's greater than, it should be here greater than. Uh, okay, finally, in the end, we have the classes vector, which is basically in the elf level. So this is xl0, xl1, xl to the, to the power l minus one. So this is the classes vector over here. So this is the notation that we are going to use for, for our binary decision trees. And now, if you remember in the beginning, we told that we do the uh, private and uh, secure evaluation of decision trees under strict security and privacy constraints. Among them, that means that we, we are hiding the depth of the tree and the structure of the tree. So how are we going to do that? Well, if this is the original tree, what we are going to do in order to to hide the depth of the tree, we're just going to replicate this guy. So again, this is a replication of the original one. And we are going to kind of merge them under same root. And in that root, we are going to add a dummy feature, which has corresponding dummy threshold. This is the first way. The second way is we're going to deal with those leaves. So basically, here in C2, 
is the leaves, the last level where, of the tree, where we have the classes, uh, we are going to split each leaf. Basically, instead of the leaves, we are going to put another dummy inner node, such as this C2, as you see here. I'm adding dummy thresholds, which whatever the value, there's still N to C2, C2. Then C1, again, is split and in a, two C1s, and they are merged into another dummy threshold. And this is done for all of those um, classes from the leaf. And basically, this is how we kind of hide the depth of the tree and the structure. And basically, we apply the first and the second approach to hide the depth of the tree to make it deeper and deeper and kind of permute the structure of the tree. And this is not all. Now let's go with our secure building blocks. The first one is secure SIMD comparison. SIMD again stands for single instruction multiple data. Uh, it takes two integers. It's illustrated. It takes two integers uh, of n integer to encrypt it and encode it vector of n integers. So basically, AC and BC. So this is my AC and BC. What we are going to do is the following. I'm going to firstly subtract A. C and B, C in SIMD manner. Then I'm going to add another random value. And to all of this, I'm going to add another H1 such that, such that those R's, R1, R2, are random, but they are all greater than zero. And the corresponding ages are, their absolute values is smaller than those RVs. So basic ages can be negative as well. And this is done for I going from one to n. Now we have the resulting vector over here, and if a certain index of the vector, certain slot of the vector is greater than one, that means that the corresponding ai is greater than bi. Otherwise, if corresponding slot in the resulting vector is smaller than zero, that means that a two is smaller than b two. So this is how we compare in simple fashion to integer. Uh, uh, to uh, vectors which are encoded and encrypted in ciphertexts. Ciphertext permutation, it's illustrated given with this pseudocode and illustrated in this figure. As an input, we take a ciphertext and um, basically uh, we take another vector k, which, go, which has m entries. Basically, in the input ciphertext, we kind of split the coefficients indexes into blocks of m slots. Concretely, in this case, we are dealing with three slots per block. And then we use the vector k to kind of permute them inside of their vector. So the values of k are two minus one minus one, which means that the first element of each block is going to be rotated by two for two slots. The second one is going to the right. The second one is going to rotate it to be rotated by one to the left. And the third one is going to be rotated by one to the left again, and it's done for all of the blocks. So this is the output. And how do we get concretely this output? Well, it's illustrated in this figure. So since we have three blocks concretely in this case, we are going to construct masks, uh, which for each block, so for the first entry or the first element of each block, I, we have one and everything is else is zero. We multiply the first mask with the input. So basically I'm, I'm getting the first element of each block, then I'm rotating them by two, and then we get this result. So basically A1 goes two slots to the left, and it, it's the same for all the elements of the other blocks. I do something similar with the second mask. I put one in the second slot and everything else is zero, and one is one in every slot of each block, and then I multiply it with the inputs. Then I rotate it to the left by one, and this is what I get. So A2 was here and I goes here. And something similar happens with the second element of all of the blocks. Similarly for third elements, I multiply it with the corresponding mask with the input, and then I rotate it by one to the left. And this is what we get. Finally, I just add up those ciphertexts to get the desired output, where I repeat again, um, uh, elements of each block, the first element of each block is rotated 
uh, by two inside of the block and the second element is rotated by minus one inside of the block and the third one is by minus one, basically one to the left inside of the same block. Basically, this is what we get in the end and the details are given in this uh, figure over here and this is the pseudocode, how it's done. Okay. Of course, we have the inverse secure ciphertext permutation, which basically does the inverse of, of what we have. It's kind of trivial, if you wish. Now, let's see how we are going to securely and privately evaluate our decision trees. A kind reminder that we have the feature order vector, which basically tells us the order of the feature from the root till the last level of the inner leaves of the tree. Then we have this vector, DTMV, which is basically the vector of the thresholds, where the values of the thresholds are kind of ordered according to the feature order. And if we have a query XV where the entries of XV are basically, again, ordered according to feature order, then we just want to compare DTMV with XV in secure and private fashion. And we're going to do it using the secure comparison protocol that I just explained. So let's see. And of course, let's not forget the classes vector where basically we put those classes in it. Okay, so this is the classes vector where we put the classes, the, which are basically the leaves of the of the our decision tree and they are put in order. So now let's see our first secure decision tree evaluation uh, protocol, the version one. It's maybe better illustrated over here. So basically uh, the client is or clients are going to construct their queries, but when they're going to do it, so we have the feature order, actually the server has sent a permuted version of the feature order and the permutations are done according to this K vector, which we just explained it and uh, mentioned it when we explained the secure permutation protocol. So basically the feature we have here at the client, a permutation of the feature order. Based on that, the client constructs the, the, their query. So this is the actual order, but here we permute the order according to a certain permutation. After the query is constructed according to the permuted feature order. It's encrypted, the second step, and sent to the server in encrypted form. Now the server has those DTMV, which is basically, uh, DTMV is basically the encryption of, of DTM, DTMP, which is basically the encryption of this threshold vector. And now what we are going to do is this, compare those two vectors, DTMP and QC, which is basically the encryption of XV. We just compare them in SIMD fashion. One secure comparison, we compare all of the values of the thresholds and the query entries in one comparison, in SIMD fashion. Okay, so it's done. But before doing it, of course, we want just to have the actual order of uh, the query. So that's why we are going to use the inverse ciphertext permutation, which, which we just mentioned and explained. And after doing it, we are going to get the result x qx, which is basically, I repeat again, qx is this vector, which is the encryption of xv. Now we can compare them, which is done in the fourth slot using the secure comparison protocol that we explained. And then the result is sent back in the fifth step to the client. And the client has the decryption key, is going to decrypt the results. And based on the comparisons, is going to find uh, the final classification for its label because the classes V now reside at the client side. So on the server side, we have only the threshold vector encoded in a plain text, whereas the classes vector say stay at the client. So we are going to find the final classification based on this. However, someone might complain that, hey, the classes vector is actually is actually part of the trained model. So basically, aren't we leaking something here if we just uh, uh, convey to the clients this vector? And the answer is yes and no, because this classes vector is basically, if you remember, uh, we just, you know, we, we might permute the tree, we add extra layers and, you know, 
hide the tree, add the depth. So basically this class is this kind of, if you wish, you know, this kind of, you know, changed structure of the tree. But still, you might complain that we don't even want to reveal that. In that case, if that's so, we have the second version of secure decision tree evaluation protocol where this class is V now resides at the server in terms of a plain text. So the output of the just explained protocol, secure decision tree evaluation version one, continues is basically the input of this class retrieval protocol, which basically is doing the following. So now, after, after we do the comparison over here, we know based on these comparisons by traversing the tree to which class we should, uh, which class the, the the label should be labeled. But we don't have the class. That's what we're going to do. Say if this is the class that we, this is the slot where the class, uh, where to which the label belongs to, to the query, we are going to put everywhere zero, zero. And in that one, we are going to put one, okay? So basically, this is what we are going here. The class index is going to be used to construct this um, vector, which has everything zero except one in the slot to which the class belongs. We are going to encrypt and encode this uh, final level and send it to the server. Now the server has this class's vector, and we just multiply them. And since, you know, this final level C has everything zero and only one slot has one. When we multiply them, basically we just have the class label. So here we are using classes P. It doesn't stay anymore on the client side. It stays on the server side. So server doesn't have anything in the second version of the protocol related to the trained model. So after multiplication, we just send the final result to the client. The client decrypts it and gets the only non-zero value basically is the final level classification of the query, and this is how we get it. So this was basically class retrieval, this part over here, class retrieval protocol. So basically, secure decision to evaluation version one is this part over here. The output of SDTE v1 is basically the input of the class retrieval, and our secure decision tree evaluation version two protocol is basically calling those two protocols in order one after another. Okay, so this is it. Theoretical analysis. So we give the homomorphic or computation costs, homomorphic costs, uh, theoretical, uh, homomorphic complexity, if you will, of algorithms one through six. And we see they are logarithmic and here they are linear based on M. And M was the number of blocks in, in slots, if you remember, from the secure uh ciphertext permutation however m is usually a small number let's say two three four that's why for two we plug values two here what we are going to have for two or three or four basically we're going to have kind of constant numbers that's why this makes our algorithms four and six constant time algorithms and kind of reminder the algorithm four is basically secure decision tree evaluation version one and algorithm six is secure decision tree evaluation version two so they are constant time. And another remark is that this is true if we can encode all of those dis uh, thresholds in one ciphertext. And it's often the case because the plain text modules that we are going to use are like 16,000 or so. Basically the depth of the tree is like, you know, up to like uh, 13 or so. But, and in practice, we rarely need uh, tr and use trees that have depth which is more than 30, more than 13 levels. Thus, this makes our algorithms a constant time algorithm in most of the cases for the experiment in order to experimentally uh, test our the proposed protocols. We use this machine. For somewhat homomorphic encryptions, we use the Microsoft SEAL library, and we use a 128-bit security with the plain take with polynomial modules of 16,000, which basically means we can encode 16,000 th thresholds, which is basically uh, the uh, depth of 
13, 14, which is more than enough for more, most of the trees. For plain text modulus, we have 24 bits and um, ciphertext modulus is coefficient modulus, the, the, the value the modulus is 438 bits. And for benchmark purposes, we use the EKG data set, the Wisconsin Prince Cancer data set, and nursery data set. And here are the results. Okay, this is uh, for algorithm one. I think this is a secure comparison. And we compare it with other schemes. So the proposed schemes outperforms the others. This is for secure uh, ciphertext permutation. So this was for secure comparison, and this is for secure ciphertext per permutation. Those are the schemes, the values. And finally, this is per query, uh, amortized per query, uh, cost for different schemes among different benchmark data sets, so EKG data sets, Wisconsin, and nursery among different schemes. And in most of them, or almost all of them, our schemes show better computation and communication costs than the state of the art. And by the way, we here give the depth of the tree, which is as you see, four, five, six, seven at most, but doesn't go more than 30. Okay, so. Security analysis and proofs. Our schemes are also shown to be secure under the semi-honest model. They are safe even to quantum computer attacks because the proposed uh, somewhat homomorphic encryption schemes are show that they are resilient to quantum computer attacks. Uh, attacks, and yeah, basically in this paper we proposed. Uh, a few secure, we used and adopted and improved a few secure building blocks. On top of them, we uh, proposed a couple of secure and private decision tree algorithms, which show to have better computation and communication costs, as well as security and privacy characteristics than the state of the art ones. And by state of the art, I repeat, we mean exclusively schemes which deal with secure and private evaluation of decision trees. Thank you for your attention.